Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and hello to our online audience. Welcome again. My name is Valerie, and I'm an alumni from the uh, class of 2010. Thank you for being a part of You Alive today. Um, you Alive is a platform that showcases many of the outstanding members of the alum NUS community who are championing causes that will make this a better world. The program today is divided into three sections, a 10-minute talk by our speaker, Mr. Asim Thakur, a 10-minute interview with Mr. Viswa Sadasivan, chairman of the You Alive organizing committee, and a 40-minute Q&A session. If you wish to ask a question, please make your way to, your, the, to the microphones at the aisles and speak directly into them. This is so that the online audience will be able to hear your question. Please keep your questions short and concise, remembering to focus on the why of the speaker's passion rather than the technical details of his work. Thank you for your kind attention, and please sit back and enjoy. We have a global vision. We recruit students and faculty from around the world. We give them opportunities to learn how to be effective in many cross-cultural settings. And we do this by creating a very diverse environment in NUS. And when people from outside look at the university community, what they see are very rigorously educated individuals who do well in their work. But you know, there are so many universities that are catching up today and we need to look for a differentiating factor. We must have strong heart. Um, we must go beyond just mainly uh, academic excellence. Not what the university does and does well, but what the university stands for. And that is the, the passion of the community. Students, faculty, staff and alumni, the spirit of the explorer. Somebody who is mentally curious, who has got initiative, resourcefulness, willing to break new ground, which requires boldness, uh, and yet is uh, somebody who is uh, prepared to do something different, to make a contribution. NUS needs to be seen as an organization that is the nurturing ground for people with great passion and the will to go out there and make a difference in their society. And that's what underscores you alive university that's alive. Where we have members of the NUS community share their passion and their commitment and their contributions in many diverse fields. To share their achievements, to share what they have gone through in their life with the student and the graduate community. Could have been a student. He, he or she could have been or is a teacher, a faculty. Could even be an employee, a staff member, or most importantly, an alumni. Individuals who have committed themselves to do very interesting and different things in many varied aspects and dimensions of uh, sports, arts, culture, community service, academic work. And what distinguishes them is a great passion that they bring to their work. The speaker, speak for 10 minutes about not so much what he does, but why he does it. What sort of trials and tribulations has he faced? Why does he believe in this? And after that, there will be a question and answer, an interview, a fairly tough interview. Following that, there will be a live question and answer session with an audience comprising about 100 people. You Alive will be in three different dimensions. One in the auditorium, right, in front of a live audience. While that's going on, it will be carried live via webcam to the student population on campus. 
and the students can actually interact live while they're watching it. The third dimension is we're going to be pumping it to linked uh, websites to more than 200 universities, some of the top universities in the world. There's another very important dimension to you alive, and that is it's mainly driven by our alumni. The whole idea is to provoke thought, ignite that latent flame that I believe strongly exists in each one of us. There are many things in life that will catch your eyes, but few will catch your heart. And only when you pursue something that you are passionate about, can you achieve greater heights. And to make even more distinctive contributions to the society we live in and to the wider world beyond. You Alive will epitomize that. Passion, action, inspiration. You Alive. There are a lot of people who care about social causes, there are a lot of people who care about charities, but they might not know what's the right way of doing it, and they might not also know that, you know, it can be very fun. Most of the charities uh, are focused on the social mission, so they might not spend enough resources on uh, the aspects of fundraising as well as awareness. I mean, think about it, when was the last time you actually saw an advertisement of the charity? We realize that you know, with the advent of Facebook and Twitter and all the social media, actually charities don't have to pay for advertisement. What if we could create a platform that connects the charities with individuals and at the same time makes it really fun for people to you know, be involved in the charity work, like uh, you know, growing a mustache for a month of November or like you know, shaving your hair or like you know, running your first marathon for a good cause. If you have a fun idea you want to use to raise funds, you will go to give.sg, you'll choose a charity of your liking and you will start a fundraising page. And uh, then you will invite all your friends, your family, your colleagues, and all other people in your social network to go and make a donation. There are no limits. It's all up to your creativity. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Asim Thakur. Hi, everyone. So who's feeling awesome today? Raise your hands. All right, we have a few awesome people here. <laughs> uh, well, I would like to start uh, with uh, you know, thanking the organizers for this event. It, when they told me you know, I've been invited for this event, I looked at the past speakers, and I felt really awesome. I felt like you know, I was sharing the stage with legends, and uh, that really made my day. And I also feel very good because you know, it's great to see all these new people and you know, familiar faces as well, so thanks a lot for being here. What I plan to do today is basically, as the, you know, the title of the talk says, uh, what would you give? And uh, to start things off, I want to start with sharing an anecdote. And uh, this is a story of a friend. And I've known this guy for about five years. And he's someone who cares a lot about sustainability. He cares a lot about mother nature. And he's someone, who'd never use a plastic bag in his life. He's someone who'd every time, you know, go to great, great uh, measures to kind of, you know, recycle. Can you imagine how he feels when he sees other people who don't give a damn? I mean, I know because I stay with him and I, you know, I live with him and I've spent a lot of time with him, right? And this guy, he always says, you know what I see? Earth is doomed, man, you know? Let's, let's, let's go to another, uh, you know, let's, let's run away to space. And, uh, you know, that, that kind of carried on for a long time until, you know, some time back he came back to me and he said, I was reading this quote which said, if everything in this world was smooth and good all the time with all the things, what would be there for us to do? And... You know, that, that, kind of, that kind of struck me, that, you know, we always face problems. We always face problems in our individual lives. We face problems as communities. We face problems as nations. We face problems as human race. And we have two alternatives. First alternative is that we can be scared. We can be afraid. 
and we can be hopeless. And the other alternative is we can be awesome, <laughs> right? And we can do something about it. We can be optimist. So I'm going to jump into sharing with you a similar, similar situation I encountered about three years back. So to start with, let me share you know, a fun time. This is uh, you know, when I was in uh, my third year in the University and National University of Singapore. Uh, I graduated from here about two years back. And I was uh, lucky enough to be selected for NUS Overseas College program. I went to Stanford, and uh, I was working in a biomedical device startup in Silicon Valley. And you know, one of these weekends, uh, my, my colleague gave me a call. He was the director of research and development there. And he said, hey, Asim, do you want to come for my birthday party? And I was like, yeah, sounds exciting, man, you know, definitely. And he was like, OK, so be there at 9 AM, and he gave me the, you know, the place. I was like, wait a minute, where are we meeting? He was like, you know, we are going to build homes for Habitat for Humanity in south of San Francisco. You know, there are a lot of people who need our help, and you know, we should do something about it. And I was like, definitely, man, I'll be there. And I asked like, a few friends of mine, and they were like, you know, that sounds really exciting. Let's, let's go do it. And you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, when we finished nailing in all the, all the you know, shingles on the top of the roof, we were thinking back. And we thought, you know, wow, that was such a fun time. Uh, you know, we did something so super cool, like you know, staying on the roof was like one of the best experiences. We were working with people who were going to use those houses, and it felt so nice to see that you know someone' life has been touched because of us. And uh, you know, it was a moving experience. So when I came back about uh, two years back, back to Singapore, you know, I I made a resolution. I said, you know what, I'm going to be volunteering. I'm going to be you know going to all these charities and making sure I do my bit. And this is what happened. So we, 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 we went to all these charities, and we said, you know, we want to start volunteering. And every time we were given a donation can, and we were asked to stand at one of these public places and you know, just try to raise as much funds as we could. And you know, it wasn't that awesome. It wasn't that awesome as uh, I expected it to be. And for some people, when I started talking to them and asked them, you know, how's your volunteer experience with charities you're working with? And sometimes, you know, this was a recurring theme. Uh, they actually found that, you know, it was embarrassing. It was sometimes, you know, they felt they were being ignored by other people. And uh, that was an issue for us, you know, that was a problem. And at that time, you know, we could have taken, we, we had two options. First was we could be sad about it and we could be, you know, just hopeless about it. Or the second one was, you know, we could be awesome about it and we could be optimist about it. So then we started thinking, like, you know, what was it about my experience in you know, volunteering with Habitat with my friends, and what is it that I can learn from there? So there were three things we realized you know, were different. So the first thing we realized was that you know, we have to involve our friends. It gets you know, more fun when you involve your friends into a fight. And we have some of them here as well in the audience, uh, these folks. And uh, you know, we, 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 we thought that it would be so much cool to convince my friend to you know, do something and for charity or to donate to a charity rather than convincing a stranger. And um, we actually found that to be true later on. Um, now we know that you know, when you try to raise funds from your you know, social circle, from your friends, from your family members, from your colleagues, uh, you actually raise five times more than you could expect to raise uh, from you know, strangers. <coughs> the other thing we realized was that you know, fun was really important. You know, you need to have fun. And if you're not having fun doing good, you're not doing good the right way. And uh, that stuck with us. So we figured that, you know, instead of asking strangers for money, why don't we start asking for, for free hugs? And you should have seen, like, you know, some of the strangers were so happy giving hugs. And so, <laughs> and so, so, so the question is, uh, you know, how did we raise money? Actually, your friends will give a lot of money as donations if they see you giving hugs to strangers. You'll be surprised how much they would give. Uh, another thing uh, we are doing this, this year in November is we are challenging all men, and all men here are also invited to be part of this challenge. We're inviting you guys to grow a mustache for the month of November. So we want you to start clean shaved in, on the 1st of November, and we want to, you to grow a mustache. And you would be able to raise funds for males, cancer-related uh, issues. 
So last point, um, uh, I think and we believe that every one of us, um, you know, every human being has the potential of being compassionate. Um, you know, we all want to make a difference to the world. We all want to change lives. And a lot of times, you know, it might not come out. But what we are trying to do here is, you know, trying to provide a platform in give.sg which would allow people to pick up the fight for the cause they believe in. So I'm happy to share with you that uh, we launched our website in uh, January 2010, and so far we have raised about $1,095,000 for about 35 charities. And the number is growing every day. Every day we are getting more companies getting involved, we are getting more donors, we are getting more fundraisers. And we plan to take this beyond Singapore. We plan to take this to other countries who are in need as well. And for that, we need each one of you. We need help from you guys. So to start with, just remember all these things. When you, uh, you know, get into problem, involve your friends. You know, fun is definitely important. And pick a fight. This is something all the young audience would, uh, would, would find a familiar face. It is a true story. You know, you got to be awesome. Let me ask it again. So how many people in the room are feeling awesome right now? All right, I changed some. <laughs> Great, thank you. You said you used the word awesome six times. What is it how mean? many of you can relate to the word awesome? Here. Awesome without a lisp is not awesome. It's awesome. So how many of you honestly can relate to the word awesome. How many of you absolutely are put off by the word awesome? Okay. It's interesting, right? How certain words actually strike a chord. Certain words may not. It didn't strike a chord with me. Yeah. I don't know what it meant. Yeah. What does it mean to be awesome? I don't know. Uh, so, so I'm just wondering. You have a great idea, yeah. but the way you sell it, actually determines the catchment, yeah. right? Yeah. The catchment can actually be much wider, but maybe the language you use, maybe the means that you adopt could actually restrict the catchment mm -hmm. unintentionally, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So this cause need not just be restricted to younger people. This cause could actually be picked up, what you're doing, right. Give SG, could actually be awesome for a lot more people other than young people. And I think that, that is sometimes the problem. Right. Okay. And uh, you, you also, I mean, I, I like your concept of the, the three steps, right? It's friends, fun, fight. Right. Three Fs. Right. Great. Right. Now, you have done all three. Yep. Many of us here, I'm sure, have also aspired to do all three. But the difference is you have actually been awesome in going forward to do it, when mm -hmm. others just think about it, mm -hmm. right? Now, talking about that, the common statement used, or common word used to describe young people today in Singapore, what's the common word? Not what young people use to describe young people, what older folks who are graying and slowing use to describe young people. What is that? Sorry? It's pejorative. It's negative. What is that? It's positive. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> it's negative. It's negative. What is that? You'll come to the positive in a while. Sorry? Apathetic. Absolutely. Are you apathetic? No, not. <laughs> apathetic is a word I've heard being used against, against young people a lot of the time. I've heard Political leaders use that word quite often when describing young people, mm -hmm. sometimes to gain political mileage, I guess. But the question is, do you, do you believe that that's true? Oh, definitely not. And to answer your first question, I think, you know, I was here to inspire and, you know, to connect with the students. So it, it appeals to them. If, you know, I was talking to you here, uh, probably, you know, I'll talk about compassion. I'll talk about empathy. You know, I'll talk about um, words which, you know, would better connect with uh, people in a different age group. Uh, but coming back to, to your question, I think it's not that, um, you know, young people are apathetic. 
I think you know they are they have been exposed to so much. You know, they've been exposed to so much information. They've been exposed to so much experiences. So in order to provide them and engage them into giving or engage them into, you know, activities which are empathetic, activities that are around generosity, you need to create engaging experiences. But if you're expecting, uh, you know, the young generation to do things the old way, which is, uh, might not be transparent, which might not be efficient, which might not en be engaging, uh, you're not going to capture us. It might not be fun. And might not be fun. You're not going to capture us. Yes, definitely. Right. So what you're saying is it's not apathy. Yes. It's not a lack of interest. Yeah. It's probably a different way of seeing the world and a different set of priorities. Yeah, I, I would say it's more about the means in which you engage people. I mean, you know, we see a lot of youngsters doing a lot of uh, engaging, ex engaging things, a lot of adventures, a lot of, uh, you know, experiences like running their first marathons. Um, you know, donating their birthdays to raise funds for charities and to do good. Yeah. But if you just ask them to, you know, give a five dollar donation, um, you know, we we don't really see how that is going to result in you know a long term effect. You know what? What's interesting is I spoke to a few of my friends uh, about this your live session, and I talked about you. And the first question they asked me was, "Is he local?" I said, what do you mean local? I, I think he's Singaporean. Uh, yeah, but is he born in Singapore? I said, no. Where was he born? I said, India. You see? Uh, I don't know whether that's the truth. I mean, to generalize is to be an idiot. But, but is it, how much of it is, has to do with the fact that you have come from a different environment where there's greater exposure to toughness, to challenges, to things that are not so sweet and smooth. You know, uh, if you were a Singapore-born person, would you have had the same drive? You may have had some measure of empathy, but would you have had sufficient drive to go and put it to action? Mm -hmm. How much of what you are, what you have stepped forward to do, which means that you have, you're paying a huge opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. Am I right? No. <laughs> financially? No. Fi purely financially? No. No? no. Why? <laughs> it's, I'm happy. I mean, financially, you know, I'm, I'm doing the things I want to do. No, no. That's, that's not what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah. Stop being politically correct. Okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about if you had gone out there yeah. and taken up a job, yeah. given your talent, I and would, you are, I would have earned more and I would have spent more. So, you know, I I'm would not have sure about spending, but I'm talking about earning more. You would have, yeah. uh, you have earned a lot more. Right. Right? right. But you, you chose not to take that path, which is the conventional path. Mm -hmm. If you're a good student, you've got good grades, and you've got credentials on your in your bag, and you've got a fair amount of drive, the MNC route is the route. Many of these guys would come knocking on your door even before you graduate, and many of you will... But you, you chose against that. Right. Uh, I, I'm not trying to make you yeah, a yeah, hero, yeah, yeah. but my, I yeah. think it's interesting for us to know what made you make that switch. Right. And switch to something where the risk is pretty high. Right. You know? Yeah. You've done well. Yeah. You've done well, but the, the risk is high. Mm -hmm. The going is likely to be tough for the next few years. Yeah. You know? What made you make this choice? It was, it was a lot of factors. I mean, you know, there's no way I can pinpoint to that, you know, this was the experience that completely changed yeah. everything and determines. I think it has something to do with growing up in India, uh, you know, where you can see a lot of uh, other people who are just like you uh, with, you know, with not enough resources. And, um, you know, you see them on a daily basis. Yeah. And you see these people and you realize that, you know, they don't have the same resources you do, but, you know, they, they should have. So it has got to do a lot with that. It has got to do a lot with uh, even the upbringing I had, where you know my mom had a great influence on me. She was very compassionate, very you know um, enterprising as well. And same same goes with my dad as well. So there there have been a lot of factors involved. And I, I what about I, friends? Friends at the point of decision. Did you have friends who stood by you, yeah, who encouraged you? Yeah, definitely. How important was that? I, I think uh, you need to have a fair bit of confidence in your abilities and the belief that you will do what it takes. And uh, I had luckily, you know, done a couple of uh, startups before Give, where I had that confidence and that faith that, you know, if I put 
my everything to make this a success, it will work. So those, those, uh, those experiences were like stepping stones to doing something bigger like GIF. Yeah. Do you plan to move on from GIF at some point or is this your final destination? I wouldn't say it's a final destination. I would say this is what I want to do right now. This as in give SG or this sort of work? Uh, I would say this sort of work and uh, by that work I define uh, it's the belief that you know everyone wants to make a difference. It's the belief that the, you know the people in Singapore, the young people in Singapore are not apathetic. It's the belief that you know if we provide them tools which can make it fun, which can make it engaging, which can uh, you know make it simple for them to be able to do good, more more, more youngsters are going to step forward and do it. It's that belief, and uh, you know, I will do things you know which will take me forward to that destination. Why just youngsters? Do you think it's not possible for older older guys to step in and do do the kind of work that you're doing? I, we are actually open, and we we believe that you know every person, whether they be young or whether they be old, uh, we want to provide tools for them. Yeah. It just happens to be that you know we are trying to solve our own problem. We see ourselves as young people who want to do you know make a change, and. Um, we want to build the tools which we think, you know, which appeal to us. So Give SG is targeted primarily at the younger generation? I, I would say that we are best at targeting younger generation, but okay. at the same time we do have people from, you know, older generation who use the platform we build. See, you're very careful, eh? older generation. They have not the money. old, you know, you're saying older generation. They have the resources, guy. so yeah. I mean, yeah. So you, you, you guys are mercenary. You use our resources and don't give us recognition. We do. <laughs> we do all the time. You know, you, the, the interesting thing is um, I've, been, I've been an entrepreneur for several years now and the company has been doing fairly well. And yet, a few, just a few years ago, my dad, who's, who passed away last year, he, he told me, he said, when are you going to get a real job? <laughs> you know, there is this thing as well. And, and although Singapore, we are trying to move away from this taboo that if you don't get, if you're not an engineer, lawyer, or doctor, you haven't, you, it's not a real job. Uh, nowadays, it's, if you're in the banking, it's considered a real job. But if you do what you do, or if you do something else that is a little bit more amorphous, uh, you're not considered a professional. You're not considered doing a real job. Uh, that taboo still does exist to some extent in, in, a, in a very uh, somewhat materialistic society where your success is still very much measured by grades. Not only that, what kind of options? Uh, recently, I was studying a report that said that uh, people of a particular ethnic community are making, taking life too easy by taking, uh, taking softer options like arts. That statement in itself demonstrates a certain value judgment, right? So how much of all this do you think will affect people like you, yeah. you know, who, who are actually interested in doing some good but don't have the strength to surmount you know, the, 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 the lack of approval, so to speak, around you. Yeah, you, you have to be diplomatic about it. I mean, so my dad, I'm very proud of him, and, you know, he was really nice f for uh, giving me the opportunity to kind of chase my dreams. And probably he's watching online, so thanks, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> right, so... so and probably because he could afford it. Uh, I, 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 I'm not quite sure about that, but at least, you know, he's, he's not dependent on... Um, on your income. On, on my income, okay. so... He, he, his point of view is that, you know, go and chase for your dream, chase for what you believe in. And um, I, th I think you're right that, you know, it can be hard if you um, do not have uh, people supporting you uh, who are in your, you know, inner circles. Yeah. So I was lucky to actually have people in my inner circles who completely support what I'm doing. And, uh, you know, they see a lot of value in it. Yeah. You know, j just a, s yeah. a short anecdote. Yeah. A few years ago, a few friends of mine from, uh, from school days, we went scouts. Uh, in RI and, um, you know, I'm, I'm 52, by the way, and, and we still meet once a month, uh, friends from RI, men, uh, friends from the age of 12, right? And scouts, we meet. And uh, about eight years ago, we got together, and uh, five of us, and we were having some beer. And in the process, as the night wore on, we decided that we, we asked ourselves as scouts, what have we done for society? And all of us got rather emotional and said, you know, we hung our heads down in shame and said we didn't do anything. You know, and one of them said, you know, I'm, I'm a board member of Rainbow Center, you know. And he said, why don't we do something for the Rainbow Center, which is a school for the autistic, uh, children who are autistic. Um, 
and that's it. We dispersed, and we didn't expect anyone to recall the conversation the night before. But what was interesting was all five of us actually emailed each other yep. right, and said, look, what are we going to do about it? And before you know it, within two weeks, we had 50 people, all scouts, coming together and saying, this is a great idea, let's do it. Uh, so we got together, yep. and we organized a great dinner, and the motivation for the dinner was not to raise funds. The motivation was to hang out with friends. Yep. Really, that was the motivation, to hang out with friends, have a lot of drinks, have a great time, and we raised $350,000 just that evening alone. Because everybody was in a happy mood, everybody was generous, and checkbooks came out, and you signed. And nobody regretted it. So what I'm trying to say yeah. is, it's really, I, it, struck me, it struck a chord, what you yeah. said about fun and yeah. friends. Yeah. When you do it with friends, it doesn't become a chore, it doesn't become yeah. a task, you know. But how many of us actually are prepared to move in that direction? It can be formal, like yeah. setting up a company, yeah. or a lot more informal, you know. Uh, maybe I'd like to throw that open to all of you. I mean, if you have questions or comments along those lines. Because I think that's one of the key things that, yeah. the key messages that I yeah. you're putting yeah, across. Definitely. You know, don't overly structure it, you know. Yeah. Have fun in the process. The, the moment you start losing fun, it goes south, mm. right? Comments, questions, not just on that, anything else? Yes, please. Uh, Could you use the microphone, please? Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm curious about um, what extent give.sg is a business, as in a kind of social entrepreneurship, and to what extent it is a charity, on top of being a portal for charities, right. is it a charity itself, or is it more of a profit-making business? Right. Could you, uh, we didn't get your name, sorry. Oh, sorry, I'm Rachel. Um, I've done, uh, I've worked actually in the nonprofit world, and I've also done research as a graduate student at NUS on uh, philanthropy, especially online philanthropy. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Rachel. You could, you could remain there in case you have a follow-up question. Yes, Asim. Hi, Rachel. Thanks a lot for your question. And uh, we are actually set up as a social enterprise. And uh, there are several reasons for that. When we were starting up, uh, you know, it was very much this concept. And then we started doing more research of how do we want to you know, structure this. Um, do we want to structure this as a social enterprise, whether we want to be a charity or we want to be a for-profit. And uh, we kind of went back to why we started this in the first place. You know, we want to create social impact. So the primary objective from day one and you know, forever is social impact. But at the same time, we want to be sustainable because we think you know, that will allow us to scale. And uh, so we are, we are a social enterprise. And, uh, we, we did spend some time thinking about charity model as well. But uh, you know, we decided to go with the social enterprise model. Okay. Is um, there a follow? Yeah. Um, I'm wondering how much you were um, inspired by um, other fundraising portals, such as yeah. uh, Global Giving, um, Idealist.org. Um, there's also Amado yeah. and Change.org. Yeah. There's a <coughs> bunch of other ones. Yeah, uh, I think I was most inspired by Kiva. Uh, you know, when I, when, I, when I saw how they were using micro loans and online, uh, yeah. you know, and uh, yes, uh, you know, we see more and more philanthropy moving into the online space. And um, could, it, you, could yeah. you elaborate sure. a little bit? Because sure. quite a few of us may not be aware of what, how Kiva works. Sure, sure. Yeah. So, so if you think about, like, you know, how philanthropy works, mostly, uh, you know, in the maybe around 30, 40 years, 20 years back, it was generally about like, you know, going after people who have a lot of money, the philanthropists, high net worth individuals. But what we are seeing today is that with the greater connectivity and with uh, you know, people willing to give small amounts, what we are seeing is micro donations and micro loans. Uh, Professor Yunus uh, you know, started Grameen Bank and um, they provided loans to the people who are really disadvantaged to build their own small businesses. And um, there is a group of uh, people from Stanford who started an organization called Kiva which basically allows you know, everyone around the world to give micro loans uh, you know, to countries like Africa and other third world countries. And we were quite inspired by that, looking at you know, how they empowered everyday people to be able to be micro lenders. And uh, to some extent, you know, we got our inspiration from them. We also got our inspiration from the way Obama raised funds yeah. uh, you know, during his election campaigns, where a lot of money came from grassroots. And uh, that, that was a big inspiration for us because after that, it was uh, you know, kind of proven that all individuals, you know, whether they be students, you know, whether they be young professionals, 
they want to help, and if you can provide them the tools, uh, you know, they'll come forward. Rachel, anything else? Um, well, I don't want to take up too much of the question time. We'll allow you one more question. Okay. Um, how do you combat um, any kind of stigma that exists um, in <coughs> Singapore um, based on past scandals that have happened with um, different uh, charitable groups? Yeah. I've heard that, that it's kind of a hard environment to do fundraising in because of um, scandals have tainted the environment for the, the charities that are actually doing right. real good work. You're yeah. talking about the NKF, starting with the NKF yes, and so on. Yes, Ren Chi. yes. Yes. Yeah. We, we very much see ourselves as an uh, enabler. We are a platform. Uh, we don't essentially do fundraising. We're just providing this utility for any other charity to use. And we work closely with uh, you know, Singapore um, regulatory bodies. Um, and we make sure that com the charities which are using the platform are you know, registered and they have their required status to be raising funds on the platform. So what, what's, what's your revenue model? Uh, the way it works is that, uh, you know, if you look at how fundraising works, mostly offline fundraising has about overheads of 20, 25%. Bring it to online, we have reduced the cost to 5%, and we have banks like take away 2 to 3%, and the rest we get. So uh, we get about 2%. So out of $100 raised, $95 goes to the charities. Um, you know, about 2% uh, goes to us, and the rest goes to the bank. So that's a commission? Yeah. I, I, I would put it as a, you know, it's, it's when you, when you think about commission, you know, it makes us sound like fundraiser, but we are not. Uh, we are a fundraising platform. The fees is actually used to make sure you know, the administrative costs and the marketing yeah. costs are taken care of. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Asim. Yes. Uh, are you there to ask a question? No, all right. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Harabjit. I'm a graduate of 2007 from NUS. Um, excellent introduction, Asim, and I was very impressed with the way you handled some of his was very tricky <laughs> questions. <laughs> um, the question I have is, what is your ultimate vision for Give.sg? Yeah. Uh, where would it be when you can say that it's successful? And how closely aligned to that vision are your own personal goals for what you as Asim want to do and want to be? Great. Thank you. Great. Great. Sure. Thanks. Uh, for, for to, to start with, where do we see GIVE? Uh, we see GIVE uh, you know, growing into something beyond Singapore and uh, starting a social movement for good. Um, we, we believe that you know, there's, there's so many individuals who want to give, and uh, you know, they have excess of money, or they have excess of time, they have excess of uh, you know, that shoe they are not using anymore. There has to be a way of getting that excess to someone who really needs it in an easy, efficient, and fun way. And that's what we exist. The day we can solve that problem, and we can solve that problem for you know, the majority of the folks, uh, you know, we'd be happy. And we'd, we would have considered us to be a success. And we are speaking of that on a global scale. Um, and if you talk about you know, what my personal vision is and uh, how does that align with what I'm doing here, uh, I am very much you know, an entrepreneur through to through. I enjoy you know, working on uh, ideas and taking them to you know, reality. And um, for me, it's, uh, you know, it's really like the best, best place to be because uh, you know, the amount of stuff uh, you know, I can learn at the same time being useful is incredible. So you know, it's, it's definitely where I want to be right now. Well, one of the things, Asim, yeah. you, you mentioned yeah. when we spoke over the phone uh, was that you believe very much in, um, in being open enough to yeah. pull in different resources, yeah. either as volunteers yeah. or short-term paid staff, yeah. you know, areas where you don't have the expertise in, yeah. you pull in staff. Could yeah. you give us your, th elaborate on that? Great. Um, I guess, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot about uh, knowing the right people. Yeah. So, you know, smiling helps. <laughs> you know, you get to make That's more true. friends. Uh, mm -hmm. and we just, you know, I'm definitely going to talk to Rachel later <laughs> okay. and learn more about online philanthropy. So I guess as, as you get more people in your networks and, uh, you know, they know what you're doing uh, is, uh, you know, taking the humanity forward and solving some big social right. problem, everyone wants to be a part of that. Everyone wants to, you know, contribute it, uh, to it in one way or the other. So, yeah, we, 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 we don't really have an issue or a problem with actually, you know, uh, getting help from people. So have, you been, have you been fairly successful in people actually coming forward without you asking them, calling for them? People coming forward and say, I like what you're doing. Can I help? Can I join you? Can yeah. I join your movement, so to speak? 
yep. you know, um, what can I do to help? Have you had such? Yeah, definitely. We actually have um, incorporated a program which is called Give Fellows Program. And, uh, you know, Give Fellows is basically a program where if you're a student or you're working, um, even working full time, you can actually devote your time or your skills to certain projects. And uh, a lot of people sign up for Give Fellows Program through our website. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's how people kind of come to help. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, yes. Hi, um, hi again. Uh, I'm Valerie, and I am representing the online audience today. Quite, quite a few comments today, and um, I'd like to pick up one question first yep. that I thought was very interesting. Actually, there are two questions, very similar but from opposite sides of the world. So I'll read, I'll read you the first one. The first one is from uh, a user named Teresa V. Holyoke, and she's from the U.S. And what she says is. I'm an older person, and I think you're awesome, Mr. Thakur. So what, she's 27? I don't know, I didn't ask. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to probe. <laughs> so uh, this is a great idea, and I've seen how dreary it can be sometimes to raise funds and to receive one fundraising request after another. So this would be a welcome change to the old way of asking and giving. So how could I bring this to my neck of the woods? So this is from Teresa. And another one, uh, I assume you may know this person, but uh, Mr. Risham Thakur. Yes, yes. And so, <laughs> uh, as per gift.sg, how different would it be to take up a similar initiative in a developing country like India? So, both these people are asking how to start something up in a developing country or a country like the US. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, um, thanks, Sarisa. You're awesome too. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so, so, and I think it's a similar question both uh, by Teresa and Risham, who's my sister. Um, yes, uh, it's very. It's, it's possible and you know, definitely we want to start a similar initiative in other countries which uh, you know, need it. Uh, I think uh, the, one of the biggest challenges uh, we will face when we try to go into other countries is that sometimes due diligence can be really hard. How do you kind of uh, classify which are the charities worth working with from the charities you know, which um, might, might be fraudulent or might have some issues? So if we can solve that problem, uh, you know, it's fairly straightforward. And um, from our experiences, what we've realized is that the best way to kind of overcome that problem is by working with the local regulatory body. And uh, please feel free to drop me a line, and then we can talk more. But does that, uh, does that necessarily work in a place like India? Working with a local regulatory body mm -hmm. works perhaps in a country that is quite tightly managed, yeah. like Singapore. But yeah. India, yeah. I'm not sure how it works. You laugh. Yeah. Do you disagree with me or what? <laughs> I'll put you up there and I'll question you. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. Yes. No, um, I, I agree to that, uh, that you know, it can be pretty hard to kind of uh, coordinate with the yeah. local bodies there. But uh, there are people who are doing similar work uh, in India. And uh, you know, it's a matter of um, partnering with them. Okay. And uh, you know, kind of. Uh, supplementing their capabilities with, uh, you know, what we have. A related point is yeah. how much of possibility or potential is there for networking across countries, across cultures, I, for this sort of en uh, endeavor? Uh, you mean uh, me getting other people involved yeah, from different a countries? across cultures, across I, language barriers, you know, using the net. Yes, I, I think... Uh, I mean, across different uh, cultures, it you know ultimately boils, boils down to finding the right people. And uh, we've been lucky enough to be in Singapore, you know, where we get a lot of students from Vietnam. We got a lot of students from Indonesia. So we actually form connections with them, and so that you know when they go back, we can kind of uh, get in touch with them and see who are the right people to talk to in there. Mm. Uh, but on a, on kind of a related point, uh, you know, it's it's incredible how easy it is uh, for you know anyone. Um, anyone here to reach out to anyone else in the world, you know, through, through all the technologies that are available. So a lot of times uh, for us, what, uh, you know, we've started doing is that we stumble upon, you know, a particular graphic designer or we stumble upon a particular photographer. Yeah. And we think, you know, there are some collaborations. So, mm. You know, we drop them an email. Uh, within, within 24 hours, you get an email and, you know, you have a Skype call and you're just like, yep. you know, I, I want to volunteer. I want to help with this cause. So we, we already have got a lot of uh, interest from people around the world. So it's, it's uh, very, very convenient now to actually make those kind of connections. It, it's, it's, it's really exciting. You yeah. know, and, but you know, uh, lately I've been hearing from certain quarters in the, in the government a growing concern that um, 
money laundering is a growing issue that's, that's infiltrating the social sector. Because it's a very powerful way to actually launder your money, mm -hmm. right? Because it gives you a, a very good cover to go in here. So how sophisticated, as you grow larger, yeah. uh, where transactions become much larger. Mm -hmm. What sort of mechanism would you have to be able to filter uh, those who are genuine or, you know, and those who may have uh, less than noble intentions? Yeah. Um, like what, what we have seen and, uh, you know, the, the, all the research I've done, I've realized that, you know, some of the big players like, you know, Global Giving, like Kiva, uh, when you reach that scale, you, you work with the right partners, you know, who have uh, expertise in those subject matters. So it's not something which you can develop in-house. You have to work with the right partners. But you do see the need for... Yeah, it, it, because the point you bring up is uh, you know, possible, definitely, if you are transacting huge amount of volumes yeah. and you're raising yeah. huge amount of funds. So definitely, that, that is a uh, you know, possible risk factor. Right. Yeah. Sorry, I saw some hands over there. Yes, please. Yeah. My name is Tan Ping, alumni of University of Malaya in Singapore, 1955. I have two questions. The first one, since your model is online, and then presumably, and your target is all, all the younger generation who can manipulate the, the mouse and so on, we will be cutting off those contributions for the people like myself who are older, presumably more experienced. That's one thing. Second thing, the, about your setting up this GIF uh, SG, yep. what trigger your intention to set this up. Right. Do you have a very bad personal experience that right. you go nowhere, you are knocking on the door of somebody and somebody turn you down or something of that sort that make you determine that I need to do something to, to save the world or whatever it is. Right. Can you comment right. on it? Sure. Um, so for, for your first question, we are definitely not uh, you know, cutting people from the older generation. We actually invite all the older people who want to give back to be on our advisory board and you know, be mentors to us because we really value the experience you can bring on board. Um, so, so that's for your first question. Whereas for the second question, um, uh, how, did, how did I make the decision to actually start this? Um, it was actually um, me and another friend, Yuming, um, and uh, when we graduated from NUS, um, you know, we were spending a lot of time thinking about what is it that we want to start doing after we graduate. And you know what? What is it that we'll be most proud of? And uh, as we as we thought about that question more, we kind of uh, you know started thinking about what are the major challenges? You know, what are the major problems in the world? And one thing which uh, particularly struck us was that you know uh, there's so many people who are socially conscious, you know, mm. and you know they want to help, they want to do something, but you know it's uh, it's you 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 kind of don't pick up the fight. You know, you, you, you talk about it, you, you complain about it, but you don't pick up the fight. And we were one of them, right? We were like, you know, we have never picked up a fight for all we say, you know, we're socially conscious and we care about the society. We haven't really done anything. And uh, that kind of pushed us, you know, into being the change we wanted to see in the world. And, uh, you know, we were quite inspired by Mahatma Gandhi's quote. And uh, we said, you know, uh, what do we have to lose? You know, we, we've done a startup before. We've seen that, you know, uh, if you put in your everything, uh, you know, you give it your best shot, you can make it happen. And um, yeah, so we, we took that leap of faith saying that, you know, we definitely know we are doing something, uh, you know, which is good for the world. Uh, uh, we, we are pretty confident in our abilities. We are pretty confident that, you know, even if we don't have those abilities, we can get it from people around. And uh, yeah, so for, for us, it was kind of straightforward. I didn't really have any experiences, uh, you know, that uh, kind of, uh, um, um, you know, that I felt compelled to do this, but it was just that I felt that there probably are a lot of people, um, you know, who want to help, but it's not easy for them, it's not fun for them. Um, you know, there, there probably can be a lot of other RI groups which can, you know, raise a lot of more money if we provided a platform for them mm -hmm. to have fun with their friends and, you know, at the same time do it in a convenient way. Right? So, so we, we, we see ourselves as kind of, you know, helping with that problem. Yes, please. Can you speak from here? No, Mike. <laughs> Your voice isn't that powerful yet. <laughs> Maybe in 10 years. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Asim. Just one uh, 
what uh, I'd like to um, hear about is um, how does your organization function? Does it work on the basis that you no know, an organization comes to you and says, "All right, I mean, we want to do you know, sort of fundraising or whatever yeah. it is." Yeah. And how do you go about it? Do you advise them, or do you just provide the platform mm -hmm. and then they just come on yeah. and uh, they you know sort of then there is a uh, some administrative. Uh, uh, arrangements or right, thing. Right. Uh, could you give us an example of sure. you know, how, how this thing works? Sure, definitely. Thank you. Thank definitely. You. Thank you. you didn't get your name. <laughs> I know your name. Donald Wyeth. <laughs> Donald. Uh, NUSS. Okay, Donald. Right. Um, so, so the way, the way uh, you can um, envision a platform, it's like a two-sided marketplace. On one side, we have all the charities which we partner with, which uh, you know, have registered on the platform. On the other side, we have individuals and companies who want to raise funds for charities. And what we are really providing is uh, a way for you to conveniently do so. So, you know, in uh, Viswas' case, if, you know, they wanted to host a RI gathering and they want to raise funds, what you could have done is, you know, you could have gone to give.sg. We have Rainbow Center as one of the beneficiaries. So you could actually, you know, put up a fundraising page there and say that, you know, we are raising funds for Rainbow Center and, uh, you know, this is the venue, this is the time, uh, make a donation. Or, and as well, uh, share this, this event page with all your friends and you know, your family members. So we will provide that tool. And then once Viswa does that, you know, all the people can come to this location and donate using credit card or debit card. So all the funds that will be raised would uh, you know, go to the Rainbow Center, the charity which uh, the individual or the group of individuals decides to donate to. Do you, sorry. Do you carry the advertisement from St. R.I.? Boy Scouts, so yeah. you just carry that. The question is whether they, they advertise the project as well. Okay, uh, in terms, in, I mean, if, if you think about like, you know, how advertisements work, the, the conversion rate is very low. If, uh, you know, I, I put up a charity and I then, you know, reach out to public, the conversion rate is gonna be very low. But if Viswa does that, if he reaches out to all his friends and he advertises to his friends, the conversion rate is gonna be very high. Yeah. yeah, they use our platform to you know, reach out to other people and collect the donations. Yes. So what's your reach currently? Uh, we, we already have, we have about 30,000 people who have used the platform uh, for donating or for raising funds. And uh, we have raised over $1 million. So for, these are people who have actively used? Yeah. Right. Yeah. But people who have visited? Um, that's, that's pretty high. I mean, you don't want to I, say don't, I, don't, I don't have a number right now. Okay. Yeah. Pretty high meaning what? It's uh, <laughs> just just to get a feel. How, how high? I, I guess about 100, 100 to 100,000. Okay, that's your regular. Uh, quick question: If you're going by the yeah. okay, if my friends and I yeah. are interested in yeah. this project, yeah. Rainbow Center, yeah. is it possible for us to connect with others, not donors, huh, but those who want to join us in co-organizing it? Mm -hmm. You know, so it could be. Uh, students from Victoria's, Victoria School, mm -hmm. right, who say, hey, that sounds like an interesting idea. Yeah. Of course, SGI will not want to work with us, yeah. you know. They say, let's work with these guys. Yeah. Is there a way in which, apart from matching yeah. donors yeah. with organizers, matching potential organizers, yeah. so that, so that it's, there's a lot more fun? Yeah. No, you, you're totally right. I think uh, the whole value of the platform we envision is going to be to be able to deliver excess, whether it be money, or in your case, what you're talking about is time, or is the skills. Uh, right now, we are focused mainly on money, but uh, moving forward, we definitely want to expand it so that you know, if you are someone who's looking for volunteers, or you're someone you know, who's looking for a particular kind of skills, yep. uh, you would be able to go there and you know, get that particular need matched. So have you had, can you, any success stories? No, I, as I mentioned, we are right now primarily focused on money, Yep. Uh, we haven't expanded to actually, you know, allow people to give time and allow people to give skills. Mm. Yeah. Why not? Um, firstly, in terms of focus, we believe that, you know, first we have to establish ourselves as the, you know, the leading. We, we already are leading uh, in Singapore, but we have to establish a little bit of more reputation mm. in um, the fundraising space. Mm. And then I think we would have, uh, you know, better credibility when we move to other Yes. Hi, I've got two more fun questions from the web. 
Uh, are, they from, are they also from Asim's family? <laughs> no, no, okay. these are different people. Uh, I'll ask both of them together and you can answer them separately. Uh, the first one is from username Marianne, and she has asked, uh, now that you've raised more than a million dollars, uh, what's the main challenge or goal that you're working on next? And Where is she from? Uh, didn't say. Didn't say, okay. Just Marianne. Uh, and the next one comes from a, an, an, ooh, hold on, mailing, and she asks, um, I'm curious as to what the daily running of a show, social enterprise is like. What's a day in the life of Asim Thakur? Thank you. Yep. Right. Uh, to answer the first question, uh, we are now focusing on um, expanding what we have been doing at Give.sg into other countries. Uh, we are starting a global website which is called Givola. Uh, it's actually givo.la or you know, givola.com. And f with that, we uh, hope to serve uh, you know, charities around the globe, uh, especially in uh, Asia region. And uh, that's, that's something which we are working for. We are putting together a team for that. We are putting together the resources we would need for that. Um, and to answer your second question, you know, what, what daily, um, you know, every day looks like. I, I think um, for us, we, we kind of have broken it into two schedules. So like, you know, first is the manager schedule. So, you know, the, the day is uh, generally about meetings and, uh, you know, it's generally about uh, uh, replying to emails, getting things done. And, at the night, it's more of a maker schedule. So basically, you know, um, figuring out what is the next step strategy-wise, less of operational, more strategy. So mm -hmm. at, at that time, we always have like you know internal meeting, and you know we always kind of uh, discussing what's 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 the next step, what are the new ideas, what are the next technology, you know, which we can build on. How do we go into mobile space? How do we use you know Facebook apps? So it's it's very much like throughout the day, it's very similar to you know. Um, uh, any other company or any other um, enterprise, but at night uh, we actually use that time to do a lot of thinking. It's, it, I think it's the same for like hard work, any huh? startup. <laughs> wow, do a lot of thinking. Okay, so what does that mean? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're, we are. When you sit together, you meditate, and you think, or what, what does it mean? Yeah, we, we, we are a very lean organization. Uh, you know, it's uh, essentially on working full time. It's me and human. Uh, so it's just two of us. Two of you full-time. Yeah, two of us full-time. And there's a lot of partners we work with. There are a lot of volunteers we work with. So there, there are a lot of times, you know, we have to really get down to figuring out, you know, how are we going to structure the different arrangements we have with new partners? How do we make sure the existing partners uh, are also at the same time, you know, being um, engaged? Engaged, yeah. So it, it, can, it can be tough at times because, you know, you have so many people wanting to help. Yep. And, uh, you know, you'd be like, yeah, you know, there's, there's so much work to be done, but how do you structure in such a way that, uh, you know, everyone feels engaged and uh, they help in driving the vision forward? What about time for networking? Because one of the risks yeah. of this is groupthink, yeah. right? You, yeah. you start, start building everything based on the two yeah. of you, but there, there's a, the downside risk of... Yeah of not really plugging into yeah. what's happening out yeah, there. It, so time to yeah. actually network with that, others. That's, that's in the morning part, which is uh, you know, the manager schedule. So I do a lot of networking. I go out for a lot of events. But during the night, it's more like you know, doing the internal meetings. Hello, networking must be done at night also. You know? I, I didn't know that before I met you. We, we, we need to have a drink and talk. I, I, OK. <laughs> you sure. know what I mean? Sure. <laughs> so maybe the second question? Yeah. The other question? OK. Those, both? Yeah, you those were the both? two questions, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, uh, we have time for two more questions. Yes. Uh, good evening. I'm Chu NUS alumni. Which uh, year? A lot of us like. Sorry, which year? Uh, uh, 1985. Okay, thank uh, you. A lot, a lot of us likes to give, uh, but uh, be it uh, religious, charity, or whatever. But sometimes we don't know where the money goes to, you know. I mean, like you mentioned, 2%. Uh, if you tell me. Uh, can you donate some money to this fund? Uh, but for every dollar you donate, 2% goes to you, 2% if you yeah. pay by credit card goes yeah. to Visa. Then I know about 96% yeah. goes, is it? Yeah. But uh, some, when this is not made known to us, uh, sometimes when the amount of money raised a lot, uh, if you raise 100 million, 2% is $2 million, you know? So there's a lot of, lot, lot of money going into your pocket which maybe I only donate, say, 50 or $100. I realize maybe I don't want to donate because you got 
2 million and if you donate that 2 million, uh, that is a lot more than my 50 or 100. Many years ago, I read this on the paper. Uh, there was a concert in China uh, where it was reported they raised uh, half, a, half a million uh, US dollar for charity. Then a couple of days later, somebody wrote in, yeah, half a million was raised, but to pay the two singer 300,000 goes to book that stadium for that big concert, 100,000. We, the charity, only got 100,000 US and not half a million that is reported. So I think a lot of time, if we know how the money is going, huh, when we donate, then we know that 95% 98 of, of our money goes to help the charity, not, you know, yeah. we are very frightening. You, you find that a lot of people may use this platform uh, to enrich themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks for your question. And uh, I actually totally understand where you're coming from. And um, we also found, uh, you know, similar things when we went into the sector, because uh, we realized that, you know, a lot of people who are raising funds on MRTs and, you know, taking your credit card numbers, they are actually third party fundraisers who take as much as 25% of, yeah. you know, donations which are raised. Uh, so we, from the very beginning, made it a point that, you know, we have to be very transparent about where the money is going to. So every time someone makes a donation, you know, we state that this is the percentage which goes to give, this is the percentage which goes to banks, and this is what charity raises. Um, and yeah, you, you're right, there are a lot of horror stories, and uh, they, th that's really sad, because you know, what ends up happening is that you, know, you have NKF ones, and then there are so many charities which take the hit, because you know, people, uh, people don't consider that you know, it was just NKF, they just say stig the stigma goes to the, you know, the whole sector as well. So yeah, we don't like that, and uh, you know, we make sure that you know, we are very transparent about uh, where, where the money of the donors go. Um, especially because you know we also we also are very concerned about that question. Yeah, and it, it's it's a great it's a great point uh, for us to bring the discussion to a close. Uh, but perhaps you have a question. I just to kind of yeah. Yeah, please. <coughs> wow. uh, hi, I'm Aman. I'm actually good friends with him from college. I'm one of those who went the MNC route and I'm doing marketing for the corporations. Uh, I think my personal opinion on the uh, percentage margin they're making, I think is too low. My personal opinion being because it's a, it's a valid argument if you think of $100 million. But what we are not capturing is how long or how much effort will take to make $100 million. Even if I talk about a million dollars, million dollars, how long did it take you guys? Say a uh, year or whatever. The amount of effort, amount of uh, uh, manpower or the amount of uh, people involved, man hours involved, technology involved, everything. And if you look at the 2%, and that's not the bottom line, that's still the top line. And you take away whatever they will pay their uh, technology partner, which is not cheap, you pay everything, you literally look at very minimum left for these guys to kind of like make. Uh, which is okay for me, what I'm not okay with him is that they're making too little to expand. You need to make a healthy bottom line to invest back to expand. So right now they have these plans to go to different countries, but how do you fund that? Nobody's gonna fund that kind of expansion, but, but everybody wants to kind of that bigger and bigger and bigger impact. And that's how I see that, uh, like the way it works with the FMCGs and uh, how to say, uh, retailers. You don't really talk margin because you both want to expand, and expansion happens when you invest uh, healthily. I'm sure you are aware of that fact. So, I mean, we need to find a good balance as well that, okay, fine, even the $5 went in, that $5 result in expansion will result in a $25 sort of impact in year three or year four. And that's how I, I mean, that's probably one angle I always keep pushing him, but that's a sort of a two-sided battle, and of course, people always wanna see where the money's going. It's a great point, it's a great point. And it, this, this, the fact that there is no clear consensus is not a bad sign, because it is ethics. Ethics is not black or white. Ethics is, by and large, subjective. You must be able to live with yourself, the decision. Right? So, so as to whether you want to move in the direction of expansion, and in the process, if you do it too fast, if the slope is too, too steep, you could lose the plot. I've seen organizations lose the plot and still want to be what you used to be, but aspire this way. So there is a question of speed as well. 
mm. right? And I think that's what the sense I'm getting, Asim, correct me if I'm wrong, is you want to settle down. You want to, you're not in a huge hurry. You want to, you want to build, consolidate, and it's consolidation is not just operational. I think it's also about the soul, yeah. right? And then you move. Working in this space, you know, I, 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 I've worked with quite a few people who work in this space as well. And I can tell you, it's a different type of person who needs to work in this space. And where you have hard-nosed entrepreneurs coming in, which sometimes is good, but it can also change the culture too drastically. And so the, the original soul and the original uh, design is sometimes suspended as a result. You know, so I think it's great that you're raising this point because those of us who are thinking of entering the space and who, are, who know of people who are already there, I think need to grapple with these issues. And these issues are going to get more and more complex as more and more corpses are going to surface. Right? Absolutely. And, and what we are doing right now for everyone who's tuned in is education. There's no silver bullet solution, so to speak. Yes, somebody had, last, it has to be the last question. My name is Gordon, I'm actually an NAO staff. Um, I just want to say something in defense of the young people, the negative thing that you mentioned about being apathetic. One thing is, who do young people look up to? It is the older generation, it is the adults, right? It is how they were taught, how they were shown to live when they were younger. So whatever the younger generation is today, sometimes it's our fault as well. I'm actually much older than most people to think. So I just want to just raise a comment just to say that I wouldn't think it's fair to say they're apathetic. I think even today's pressures that they have, you know, when I was younger, my gosh, just go to school and then happily just play, in, you know, what, what's the word? Five stone or kachik, whatever they call it, right? <laughs> today, they got enrichment classes, dance, music, whatever. So I think, to a certain extent, our lifestyle today has sort of created this problem for us. And I think we need just to look at the bigger space and understand that. Absolutely. And, and for the record, I love young people. And I do not at all agree with this idea of apathetic. It was just to provoke you, which I enjoyed doing. Well. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, let, let, me, let me bring this discussion to a close with, with, uh, with a, quiet, but, uh, a quiet statement coming from the heart. It's, it's fantastic to meet a young person like you, Asim. It's fantastic. And from the way you have articulated your thoughts, it's very clear that your thoughts are still authentic. You know, our wish for you as you move forward, and I'm sure you're going to, you're going to grow, is don't lose the plot. Don't lose the fire, because that fire is what's precious. Not the money that comes, but the fire. And we need a lot more people like you to make this a better world. Right, so don't lose the dream. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you very much. And we're very proud that you're an NUS alumni. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've got something for you, Asim. This is a gift from Great. us to you. Thanks a lot. Right? Thanks. And it's a live shot of the two of us Perfect. having a chat. Right? <laughs> Great. And that's a very nice picture of you. Yeah. Right? You need a beard and a mustache <laughs> like me. Okay. Doesn't he look really handsome? During November, I do. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Do you have a girlfriend? No. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and here is where, Asim, you say something nice about us. Oh, great. Yeah, at the bottom. Oops, sorry, sorry. sorry. Here. He's clearly not a doctor. <laughs> His writing is quite legible. You want to read it? Yeah. So, wishing NUS continues to inspire young change makers to move the world forward. Great. Thanks. Thank you.